Hey, welcome folks. Um, it's nice to see people signing on uh, to join us live here this evening. Uh, we'll get started in just a moment um, once folks have had a chance to sign on. But thank you for being here with us for ninth grade family night. Uh, and bear with us as we just wait for, for more people to get signed on. But we'll get started and get going in just a moment. So again, for those of you who are just getting signed on, uh, we'll get started in just a moment once it looks like the attendee list uh, stops climbing and looks like we're leveling out. So I think uh, we'll give it another 15, 20 seconds and then we'll get started. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Dan Rubin. I'm the Director of Guidance and Counseling here at Newton South. Uh, it's a pleasure to get a chance to spend some time with you this evening. Um, I know we had a great coffee this morning sponsored by the PTSO with ninth grade families. Um, we had close to 50 attendees. Um, so tonight we'll uh, repeat a lot of the same information that was shared this morning. Uh, but before we get going with the agenda, I know uh, we've got a, a number of folks who would like to say hello and welcome you. And first, I'll hand it off to our principal, Tammy Strauss. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, we're so excited that you're with us today. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here. I just wanted to welcome everybody. Thank the PTSO for hosting these. Uh, Dan, who will guide you through most of tonight. I do want to apologize in advance. Um, I have to run. My six-month-old has a double year infection, and she just needs her mama right now, which is giving my husband a little bit of a complex. Um, but I did want to make sure that I said hello to everybody. Um, and have a wonderful night. If you have any follow-up questions, please do not hesitate to contact your child's dean or any of the people on this panel to date. Thank you again for being here. And I'll introduce myself next. Um, I am Jason Williams. I'm the vice principal here at Newton South. And um, as Tammy said, um, we are really happy to see all of you here tonight, taking some time out of your busy evening to uh, be with us and just talk about how grade nine is going for you and your child to this point. So we hope to have a lot of good information for you today. And um, with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Will Adams of the PTSO. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, if you are new to South and this is your first child at South, um, a very special welcome. Uh, we've had a great year. I am along with Michelle Wetlaufer, one of the co-presidents of the PTSO. Um, this is my first year as co-president, uh, but it has been a fantastic year. The PTSO uh, has coordinated and run lots of events like Celebrate South. Uh, we've done several teacher and staff appreciation lunches and breakfasts. Uh, we've done some student appreciation events. Um, and every time we've reached out to the community and our parents and caregivers for any help volunteering or helping to fund all of these great things, uh, you all have stepped up. So I wanted to say thank you very much. Uh, the year is not over. Uh, we have lots of events to come. Uh, every Sunday, Michelle and I put out a newsletter. If you don't receive it, I'm going to put a link in the chat. I assume you all get it if you're here. Um, but if not, I encourage you every Sunday around six o'clock at night just to look for our newsletter. Um, and in it, we'll put in all the important events that are coming up in the weeks to come, anything in the, for that immediate week. Uh, we also put out asks um, for volunteers when we need them. So please um, take the time to read that. Um, I did put in a link there where you can um, click on and see um, all of the, the different areas that we look for uh, volunteers during the year. Some of it could take you an hour a month. Um, and they're one-off events, and there's other things that are a bit more intensive um, and require, a, you know, a weekly commitment, but there is something for everyone, and we really would love everyone to pitch in any way you can. Um, trying to think if there's anything I'm missing, um, but I think that's about it, but again, thank you for coming. I look forward to seeing all of you in the years to come. Uh, am I supposed to hand it off? Um, Jennifer? 
Hi, I'm Jennifer Morrow. I'm the history chair. Um, I feel like, can you guys see me? For some reason, I feel like I'm not showing up. Um, so I'm here today representing the history department, but also all the department chairs. And I just wanna really give a shout out to the PTSO. We so appreciate what you guys do. The teachers feel the love and appreciate it. And you do so much to help us be our best for kids. So I just really wanna thank you for that. Great. Um, thanks, Jen. And, and I'll pick up from here um, and let you know that uh, tonight's program uh, really thematically, there are three big um, ideas that we'll focus on. One is just your students' uh, continued adjustment to high school. Uh, they're now just beyond the midpoint of their first year. And, um, you know, we're, we've been really excited to get to know them. Hopefully they've been adjusting well to South, finding community. Um, but we'll be talking a little bit about um, where can you access some resources if maybe you're concerned um, that your child isn't getting as connected or rooted at South as you'd um, like or as they'd like? Um, where can you turn to for some academic support, social emotional support? So we'll spend the first portion of our evening uh, talking about just that continued adjustment to high school. Uh, from there, we'll actually start to think, believe it or not, about the next school year already, and we'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, the upcoming course registration process for the 10th grade, including some curriculum options that will become available for the first time. Um, and uh, Jen will share with you some information about some of our uh, really innovative interdisciplinary learning opportunities, um, small learning communities. Um, and we'll talk uh, just broadly about the timeline for that process, but also some points that students and families will want to think about together uh, to make planful choices. And then lastly, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, as the year comes to a close for your children, one of their culminating experiences will be uh, the science MCAS exams. And you'll hear a little bit about that, including the calendar and, and just what the testing experience will uh, look like for them. Uh, but to get us started, um, I, I will talk a little bit, just to, uh, reflect, um, Jason, if you can advance the slides, uh, just talking about uh, the overall adjustment to high school. Uh, it is normal that for all of our students, whether they're coming to us from Brown or Oak Hill, um, or perhaps they attended an elementary school in Newton and then had another experience uh, for middle school or a part of their um, elementary and middle school experience, uh, they're coming into South, and we also had this year about 75 to 80 students join the ninth grade class who did not attend school in Newton previously. They'd either been in private school their entire schooling experience, they moved to Newton from out of town, out of state, or even out of the country. Um, and during that ninth grade year, uh, really, we find that all students are looking to uh, make new connections, get uh, involved in activities that introduce them to new peers. Um, and in particular, uh, those students who maybe did not attend one of our primary feeder schools um, are oftentimes really wondering, how do I get connected? How do I get involved? Um, through the counseling department and our conversations with students and families, um, you know, a lot of students, uh, whether it was through athletics or maybe they participated in the ninth grade play through South Stage in the fall um, or other opportunities to get connected through clubs, uh, have really been settling in nicely. Uh, counselors have met with ninth grade students on a couple of occasions in guidance seminars, so group guidance lessons that are part of our developmental counseling program. Uh, what I mean by developmental counseling is that uh, we can anticipate at certain stages of academic development and advancement through their high school careers, uh, students will have uh, specific, easily anticipated kind of needs. And in that developmental guidance seminars, um, all ninth graders will meet with their counselor and they get information uh, sort of presented in digestible, manageable doses from their counselors around um, some of the same things you'll hear tonight, really. We, we focused most recently in our last seminar round about uh, accessing academic resources uh, and finding ways and opportunities for support if a student was not satisfied with uh, their grades or their academic performance to date. Um, but so they're in a new setting, they're, they're meeting new peers, they're adjusting to new expectations. 
Um, and we're trying to also help them to embrace change and to understand that um, if there is uh, any constant um, in their lives over the next few years, um, you know, change will be part of that. They're adolescents. They're going through a, a period of rapid um, growth, rapid development emotionally and socially. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the energy that uh, we see and are feeling as we're sort of continuing to advance beyond the worst of, of the COVID experience um, has just been really nice. Kids are happy to be um, in what feels to them like a little bit more of a normal school year than what we've had these past few years. Um, but with that comes the need to uh, practice flexibility, adaptability. Uh, there's a lot less um, consistency and uniformity across the um, academic experience from classroom to classroom this year, as opposed to for many, school, uh, many students, their middle school experience, where um, all of the team teachers on a particular team might have a common approach to um, how they communicate assignments or how they plan assessments in a way that students don't have multiple tests or quizzes on the same day. Um, there is just naturally a, a lesser degree of coordination um, amongst the students, teachers here at the high school, and for students learning how to uh, manage that, manage their time ever more effectively, um, and when they are a little bit jammed up, learning how to self-advocate and communicate that to, to the key adults in their lives, uh, those are all important skills. And, you know, sort of one of the, the other pieces that we'll be spending some time on uh, later in the spring um, in our guidance seminars is really talking about um, these healthy coping strategies, making sure uh, that students are able to recognize when they might be engaging in ineffective coping, whether that's procrastination or, um, you know, excess screen time, which I suppose is a form of procrastination, um, or, or just other um, alternatives to sort of tackling whatever is challenging them head on, um, you know, learning how to cope in more effective ways. Um, we spend some time with them just exploring those ideas and identifying what are some of their go-to coping strategies. So uh, that's all part of that continued adjustment. Um, and Jason, if you can advance the slide again. Thank you. Um, you know, so taking a look uh, at this next slide, um, you know, one of uh, the, the key goals that we have for all students is to help them um, learn how to make South their school. Uh, South is a big place. Uh, we've got, you know, close to 1,850 students that can feel a little bit overwhelming, um, but there are so many welcoming and vibrant communities within South um, whether that's uh, in a particular classroom uh, where maybe there's a, a strong sense of identity that forms between uh, peers and their teacher or around a certain interest area in a club or in an extracurricular co-curricular activity um, in teams in on the stage. There are just so many opportunities for students to uh, participate in activities that allow them to really build towards uh, mastery and skill development and feel that sense of connection and belonging uh, with their classmates. Um, a, a, a good question that I will often encourage uh, families, parents to ask their children is, you know, where are you feeling connected? If you were, you know, having a bad day, like where's the place that you would go to within school that would make you feel a little bit more comfortable? Uh, those are great conversation starters and a great opportunity to learn from your child so where they are feeling connected at school. Uh, and if your child is having a hard time identifying where they are feeling that sense of connection or which community uh, might be um, helping them feel you know, included and that sense of belonging, uh, that's a great indication that you know you might want to encourage them to check in with their counselor around uh, identifying opportunities to get more involved in the school community. Uh, we certainly welcome you to reach out directly to your child's counselor and share your observations uh, or if there are any concerns that you might have. Um, but your child's counselors are, are there to uh, systematically through these guidance seminars but also through individual one-on-one um, -on -one interactions and problem-solving conversations, 
uh, to introduce your kids to uh, academic, social, emotional resources, um, really all of the supports within the building uh, that help them to um, understand, recognize, and advocate to have their needs met. Um, counselor interactions with families and with students um, include a wide range of activities, but big ideas and big areas that we help students in their development are around academic development. Um, so for many ninth graders, that looks like learning how to manage their time effectively. Um, we will, as I mentioned earlier, spend some time talking about scheduling from a standpoint of um, academic commitments that students might be thinking about for the future, but also just those day-to-day, moment-to-moment um, activities, uh, understanding how much a you know, student might be able to take on before they're feeling like they're sacrificing or compromising um, elements of their well-being, like social time with their friends or um, just being able to, you know, decompress and stress, uh, de-stress a little bit, um, if that's shooting hoops, if that's doing some artwork, if that's taking the dog for a walk, whatever that might be that brings them some, some peace and, um, you know, just fulfillment. Uh, we always want to make sure that students have opportunity in their lives for that as well. Uh, we talk to students about uh, their emotional wellness. Um, we are uh, very much a, a judgment-free zone. Um, you know, our goal is to make sure that students feel comfortable um, coming into their counselor's office and just knowing that whatever's going on in their lives, we are there to listen and we are there to help them to uh, problem solve. Um, you know, that might be, um, you know, issues that they're having with a peer, that might be a conflict that they're feeling um, with their teachers, it might be um, stress or tension, um, you know, in a relationship with a sibling or a parent at home, we're there to listen. We're also there to be partners with you. Um, so if there are concerns that you have about your child's emotional wellness, if you're seeing a change in affect or mood that is concerning to you, please reach out to your child's counselor. Let us know. Um, we are your eyes and ears in the building. Um, and in many ways, you know, you are our eyes and ears outside of the building and really help us to understand your children's needs um, across uh, their entire experience, their lived experience. Um, lastly, and I guess this ties in with the academic planning, um, we do spend a lot of time with students um, usually not as early as ninth grade when it comes to college exploration, um, but we will spend time talking to students about uh, their interests, their uh, potential ideas for future careers, and how that does connect with their studies. Um, but as your children go through their high school experience, um, a big focus towards the latter half of their high school career becomes figuring out um, wh what does this next transition look like. So just know that that's uh, on the horizon. Um, Jason, if you can advance it. And I think, um, Jen, are you going to uh, talk a little bit about some of these academic resources students can access? Yes. So hello, everyone. Again, I'm Jennifer Morrill, the history chair. Um, and I just say on the onset, I'm going to try to describe to you these resources and options for next year. But if you have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to ask. So you may have heard your child talk about wind block. Wind block occurs three times a week, and that's when kids can sign up to meet with a particular teacher and get some help. Um, academic support, and wind block is kind of nice because kids have flexibility. It's also, I see a lot of students hanging out with their friends during wind block, and that's kind of lovely too, where they get to have a time to connect with some other people. Um, so it's both academic, it can be social, it, sometimes we run special programs in Windblock. So it's a, a kind of exciting reserve time where kids can do a lot of different things. Academic support centers are places where kids can go and get some specialized help from teachers who are signed up to help kids in those support centers. So for example, the math center and the writing center. Um, we also have something called small studies. If a student is struggling and is getting lower grades, um, we will um, some, we'll talk with you first, of course, but small studies are an option where a student can go to a small study and there's academic teachers there who can help them. And those um, teachers are communicating with the student's teachers so it can be more targeted support. And peer tutoring is something that some students have really been engaging in recently where they're 
engaging students and helping younger, older students, helping younger students with their academics. So that's an exciting opportunity as well. Great. Thanks. And so, uh, you know, that's the academic side of things. On the social emotional side of things, just in terms of um, the range of supports that exist in our building to support students' social emotional needs. Um, so, I, you know, I mentioned earlier our developmental guidance program, uh, but uh, at the high school level, not only are all students assigned to a guidance counselor, it is expected that all students on a pretty regular basis are having um, some connection with their guidance counselor. I know that isn't always the case in middle school uh, in terms of just how the role is um, implemented and defined. But um, at the high school level, all ninth grade students have at this point had a couple of guidance seminar meetings and at least one individual check-in um, just with their guidance counselor. The intent behind that is to make sure that we, we become a known entity to your students um, as early as possible. Um, you know, many students might uh, not require any kind of um, acute or urgent responsive services. Um, they have not found themselves in any kind of crisis in or outside of school. Uh, but in the event that a student does uh, find themselves in distress, um, it's very important to us that they know um, who their resources are in the building and specifically who their school counselor is uh, before they find themselves in, in a distressing situation. So we invest in that a great deal in the fall, um, and uh, we work with a, a broad team across the building of other providers. Uh, those other providers include our school adjustment counselors and school social workers. Uh, we are fortunate to have a really, really talented staff of clinicians in the building. Uh, many of our clinical counselors um, are uh, exist within our, our special education department, um, but there are a couple of particular social workers uh, who work with our general led population as well that I'd like to just identify. Um, one of them is Brian Dulesky. Um, Brian is, uh, he's been with the Newton Public Schools at South for about 10 years, but prior to that, he had a long career as well with uh, the Department of Children and Families. Um, he's a licensed social worker. He's also an addiction counselor and has a lot of expertise um, in the area of alcohol and drug abuse and addiction counseling. Um, and he has a, a role that we refer to as uh, our prevention and intervention counselor. Um, just important to note that um, you know, if a child is um, experiencing um, errors in judgment uh, in school around alcohol or dr other drugs, um, they may be as part of disciplinary consequences referred to Mr. Dulesky um, for some check-ins and counseling. Um, but we also will, from time to time, have families that reach out. They share um, that they're concerned uh, that their child may be experimenting um, with alcohol drugs. They're uh, no, not sure how to respond to that or if their child needs some counseling um, around that substance use. And uh, Brian is a tremendous resource on that front. Um, you can reach out directly to Brian. You can also reach out through your child's school counselor. Um, but Brian also works with a number of students um, in our school adjustment social work capacity for short term needs. Um, and, you know, it just really close partnership with the school counselors um, in terms of supporting students. The other specialized role I just want to make you aware of, um, Nicole Motley, who's another one of our um, school social workers. She, uh, as part of her job responsibilities, is what we refer to as our clinical care counselor. Um, in that role, Nicole is um, the case manager. If we have students who are experiencing acute mental health crises that require um, a hospital level of care, so either a day treatment program or even an inpatient hospitalization, um, Nicole will work in tandem with your child's school counselor to coordinate and communicate with a clinical team outside of school um, in the hospital level of care setting. Um, she works uh, in coordination with your child's counselor to help um, organize uh, any academic work that a student might miss if they're out of school. Um, and then lastly, uh, Nicole also will um, typically run uh, along with your child's counselor and dean um, a re-entry meeting upon return from an extended absence to make sure that there's a, a really good plan in place 
uh, for reintegration and making up work and just that um, we we know that students uh, are feeling well and supported um, when they return to school after any kind of absence um, related to mental health. Um, couple of other just sort of uh, ways that counselors are supporting students' social and emotional well-being are through our developmental guidance seminars, along with um, some specific um, social and emotional learning themed wind block opportunities. Um, there are also opportunities, um, some of them psychoeducational groups like our stress less group uh, that we run where um, kids learn some um, skills for managing stress and anxiety, how to identify thinking errors and thinking traps, um, how to use some uh, techniques to calm their bodies and minds um, using sort of mindfulness and meditation practice. Um, there's some really great learning opportunities there. And uh, also during our block schedule, um, the counselors are providing uh, just some recreational activities that are more about connecting uh, for students. There are um, some uh, groups that are doing coloring. There's Play-Doh. There's um, a group of a couple of counselors who are um, showing uh, videos on Netflix about you know sort of mindfulness and meditation practice and really understanding um, the relationship between mind and body, and then leading some discussions. Um, ninth graders are sort of our, our key demographic for a lot of these groups, uh, because they are able to potentially leave a study hall and join one of these groups. Uh, whereas with our 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, um, the counselors are competing against free blocks. So it, it's at times a little bit tougher of a sell. Um, but you might want to ask your, your student if they've heard at all about any of the counseling groups going on in the counseling center. Um, and then just the last uh, thing I want to mention around just social emotional supports and resources are some of our affinity groups and spaces. Um, a lot of our student organizations are um, affinity groups, uh, whether that's related to race, ethnicity, religion, um, our gender and sexuality awareness club, um, our, so just sort of thinking of a few of them, um, GSA, as I mentioned, our Black Student Union, um, our South Asian Student Association, the Asian Student Organization, um, which is primarily East Asian students, the Jewish Student Union, uh, you know, there, there's a whole range of groups, uh, and some students find that that is an area where they find a real sense of belonging and solidarity and an opportunity to celebrate um, an identity that they hold dear in a large and diverse school and to feel that sense of kinship and connection. So for many students, um, that can be something that helps our school feel just a little bit smaller um, and can be a real nice social and emotional support for them. So um, I, I don't know if it makes sense for us and I, I have not, I will admit, I have not been keeping a close eye on the Q&A um, but um, we're at sort of a transition point going from talking about the transition in academic resources and social emotional resources to starting to think towards course selection. Uh, and I just uh, will keep an eye if there are any questions that come in related to anything you've heard so far. Um, I'm gonna practice a little bit of wait time. But. No, perhaps we, we move forward to course registration. Um, so I, I'm going to start off with just a, a couple of, of big thoughts here, and then um, you'll hear a little bit more from Ms. Morrill and also uh, from Mr. Williams. But um, overall, with the transition to 10th grade, uh, the biggest things to keep in mind for your children are that they will have more options for curriculum levels, and that is true across um, all disciplines this year. So for ninth grade, you may recall that the only discipline um, that had an option other than ACP or CP as a level would have been in math, where students may have been recommended um, for a course last spring um, that they started this year, 611A, which meant that they were identified uh, as a candidate for either accelerated ACP or honors math. Um, the first term of their ninth grade year, their teachers um, were engaged, among other things, in assessment, and by the end of term one, um, students were designated as being in a particular level in math. 
Um, but so just as math had an honors level um, beginning in ninth grade, all of our core academic disciplines will have uh, course offerings available at the honors, ACP, and CP level uh, for 10th graders. So there's more to think about. Um, and uh, there's also sort of this wider and deeper variety of elective uh, possibilities. If your child took an arts foundations course this year as a ninth grader, all of a sudden the entire arts department catalog becomes available to them. Um, that's probably the greatest example of uh, where a, a sort of prerequisite course might open doors, um, but there are also just other general electives that are available for 10th, 11th, and 12th graders that were not available to 9th graders. Uh, the program of studies, Mr. Williams will get to this shortly, uh, will be posted soon. And it's a good opportunity for your students to begin to just peruse that catalog and uh, get a sense of what elective courses they might be interested in for sophomore year. Um, balance. So uh, we talk a lot about balance. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, I know I feel a little bit like I'm on a soapbox and I apologize for that if it ever comes across as um, a little bit too preachy, but um, we see a lot of students who um, they try to fill up every moment of their day being what they feel is productive and um, knowing that, you know what, if I can do it, um, maybe I should do it. And we'll see students who are recommended for um, many classes at you know the highest level of a you know that they might be able to access whether that's a teacher really encouraging them to stretch from CP to ACP or from ACP to honors um, and what we just remind students of is it's not always easy to stretch in every domain at the same time um, and that it's really important for them to think about where am I going to find fulfillment and enjoyment um, you know, this morning in our parent coffee, I shared that uh, just one of the saddest things to hear is when a student feels like they are grinding and grinding and working their butt off in a class, and it's not enjoyable for them. It's not something that they actually um, would really choose to study at that level were it not for some um, imagined um, payoff or reason that they're doing it. And it's just an important conversation to have with your children. Um, Ms. Morrill may talk about this a little bit more, but um, you know, students at the honors level are really expected to have a genuine enthusiasm for the subject, to want to seek um, additional learning opportunities beyond the classroom and extensions. And when a student feels like it's a chore or a burden to be in that class, um, some of that joy of learning is lost. And we just we really want to see that students are making thoughtful choices that honor um, where their their interests and where their heart is at. Um, and for this last bullet point around small learning communities, um, I'm going to ask Jen to to take over. So hi, I'm Jennifer Morrill again, the history department chair, and I'll represent kind of broadly um, the other departments, but I can of course use examples from the history and speak to that most clearly. So. Small learning communities are opportunities for students to be in a small learning community, meaning that they're with the same group of kids in perhaps two different classes. And I wanna emphasize that the small learning communities aren't somehow better or more challenging. They're in the small learning communities, kids are learning the same content. It's the same goals in terms of their overall academic content, but the structure is different. And um, it makes a big school smaller. And sometimes the way they're approaching that learning can be different and, and have exciting options for some kids. For example, um, in 10th grade, students can opt to either take the standard English and history course or they can do a linked English and history course. And there are two ways to do that. One is in something called new media communities where students are it with the same group of kids in English and in history, and they're learning the same content, but they're packaging that learning, they're conveying their learning and understanding often through um, different kind of media, like a podcast or a documentary. Those students are still learning to write. It's one of our very important learning goals that all students learn to write analytical essays. And so 
kids shouldn't go into new media thinking that they're not going to write. However, for some kids, being able to make a podcast or a documentary or learning how to convey complex analytical thinking through those media, it's just, it's really good for them. It's a good fit. We also have something called Global Communities, which is also a linked history and English class. And Global, again, is largely the same content, but those courses are taking a little bit of a humanities approach, and they also are thinking about issues of global justice. So they're great. It's for kids for whom South is either a big place and being in a small learning community would be a good opportunity to make it a smaller place, or for kids who want to link English and history or to think about different ways to convey their understanding through media, those options are really good. We also have something called the Da Vinci Program, which um, has students linking. Um, it's a project-based collaborative approach to learning that tries to link science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So students are really bringing together those disciplines in the way that Da Vinci did, the namesake of the program. So again, it's a, it's a nice other option for a small learning. The small learning communities are multi-level, meaning that we have kids working at different levels in the same room. Um, and I will say that in English and history, we also have some mixed level classes other than the small learning community. The final thing I'll say about levels is I think the first person for your child to consult is their teacher. The teacher's goal is to really help students end up in a course that's right for them. And so, and the teachers are good at this. They think a lot about where, what, what if, um, where are students in their learning and what would be the best fit. So if your child has any questions, they definitely should talk to their teacher. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call the teacher. If you have questions beyond that conversation, the department chairs are always willing or happy to talk to you, I should say. I think the, the most important thing is in this registration process that you and your child feel like you have the information you need to make a good decision. And that at the end of the day, everyone feels like there's a good plan and it makes sense to everyone. So I think communication is golden. I just wanna underscore that South is a large institution and sometimes you know it can feel kind of distant in terms of how to get in touch with some of us, but we're a phone call away and we'd really like to take your questions and help everyone feel good about the plan. Another thing I'd like to emphasize is nothing is set in stone. So if your child opts to do something and it turns out to not be a great fit, we'll help them adjust the plan. So we can't move kids from class to class easily in the fall, but we'll do whatever we can to, to help them shift. And in terms of level with mixed level classes, students can try a level and switch if they need to. So um, please don't hesitate to call if you have questions and I hope that information was helpful. All right, so I'll go ahead and go next. Um, and actually, this is going to be uh, part of the answer to one of the questions that's in the Q&A right now regarding uh, when do students need to sign up uh, for courses for sophomore year. So I'm going to hit answer live for that um, question. And again, um, as a reminder, I am uh, Jason Williams. I'm the vice principal. And one of the things that um, I'm, I'll talk about here is the calendar for course registration. So every year, this calendar uh, shows up in these four different phases, and um, the timing of those uh, phases will change ever so slightly every year, but essentially it always works like this. The first phase really is the part where teachers will recommend courses for students for next year, so they'll talk to their classes about registration. We actually have an advisory plan in the future where that conversation will begin, and we'll show students the same, uh, the same chart. Um, and then teachers will use our system called Aspen, which you would you know about to um, recommend the courses. And then after that, that timeline ends, there's a period where students were able to uh, request additional courses in Aspen. So these are courses that don't require a teacher recommendation. And then um, counselors are, will review course requests during most of the month of March. And then after that, on April 3rd, that's the really the last day of us putting courses in, and that will be the time that uh, we verify the course requests and make sure that everything we put in was right, because at that point, we then need to prepare to figure out, you know, how many sections of this are we offering? How many sections of that are we offering? Are we offering this at all um, um, to figure out those things for next year? So this is really the major timeline that um, 
everyone will need to be aware of. So we're giving this to you now as a kind of an early preview of sorts. And we will eventually be talking to all the students about this same timeline as well. A couple of uh, other things here that's really important. One of the most important parts that Dan actually uh, alluded to was is the program of studies. So that's our course um, catalog. That will hopefully be online by Friday, February 17th. We're actually uh, furiously working on our edits right now, and we hope to have those edits ready by end of the day Monday, so then we can work on finishing up that uh, book for this year. Last year's book should still be on the school website, and um, there's copies of that book in the library and house offices and a couple of other places. So if a student did want to view the program of studies book for this school year to see an example, there um, the library is a great place to access that book so they can see what it looks like. This uh, upcoming year's version will look very similar to uh, last this current year it's just it's so they'll get an idea of like what to look for and how to look for it so it'll be a good thing to refer to if they're very curious um the other i think items here that we kind of just mentioned really quick um so i think we talked about the first piece already um in pretty good detail for the second piece for march 6th to march 13th one of the other parts mentioned here is um students will see their core core selections pre-populated in aspen so they'll be able to see what courses their, teacher, their teachers recommended them for at that time, um, but they and they are allowed to select their electives. And then during that next period from um, March 6th to the 31st, they can have the con conferences with their counselors to work with things as needed. But I'm gonna let Dan finish the rest of this slide to go into more detail about that part of the process. Rookie mistake, not unmuting myself. Thank you, Jason. Um, so yes, to, uh, to get into, uh, what, uh, Jason was just sharing. So during the month of March, uh, counselors will be having one-on-one -on -one course registration conferences with all of their students, um, in grades nine, 10, and 11. Uh, we try to prioritize one grade per week. And, uh, while we have not officially finalized our schedule, um, we will be doing that at our department meeting on Tuesday. Um, we expect, and I expect that probably that week of, week of March 6th, we will likely be meeting with our seniors, uh, rising seniors, current juniors, uh, because they have the most complex set of demands. We try to um, put them on the earliest end. Um, and then that week following, so the week of March 13th, I expect that to be the week that we are meeting with current ninth graders, rising 10th graders. Um, and then the following week with um, 10th graders who are heading into 11th grade. But what those conferences entail, um, it might be during a wind block, it might be during a study hall, directed study, it might be that um, your child's counselor is even saying, you know, are you able to meet with me during a lunch or during lion block? Um, we will prioritize uh, the times, wind block times and lion block times for students who do not have any other space in their schedule. And otherwise, we will likely be meeting with students during a study hall. Uh, but we have conversations with them where we review, um, are they on target in terms of graduation requirements? So for rising 10th graders, um, all of them have certainly remaining requirements in front of them. But if they did not take an elective course this year that might have earned them some arts credits, we'll have a conversation about whether it makes sense to perhaps get started on that to leave uh, lots of opportunities open in the future when they're choosing courses for 11th or 12th grade. We make sure that they're signing up for sufficient credits. So um, we will ask that students sign up uh, for a minimum of 72 credits of coursework and a maximum of 84 credits of coursework. Um, so there's a, a range in there. Um, 72 credit credits represents six full periods um, in our seven block schedule. So a student who signed up for 72 credits would, uh, if their schedule was perfectly balanced, they would have three study periods or uh, free blocks per week um, across the year. If a student were to sign up for 84 credits, which is the equivalent of seven 12 credit periods, uh, they would not expect to have any study halls at all during the course of the year. So that's um, just a framework to keep in mind, um, depending on whether your child um, 
really wants to take full advantage of every learning opportunity in front of them and sign up for as many credits as possible, or if you recognize that uh, your child really benefits from having some time to get work done during the day, perhaps they have um, work responsibilities, sports responsibilities, childcare responsibilities outside of school hours, it is sometimes very helpful uh, for students to be able to get some work done during the day. Um, that's really an individual decision, but that's something that we'll talk about with you and we encourage your, uh, with your children rather, and we encourage them to talk about with you. And if you have any questions for us, please at any time reach out. Um, we encourage and uh, actually ensure that students are signing up for alternate course choices. Uh, we do have some disciplines, some electives that um, just year over year, it's and it's it's easily anticipated that we'll have more course subscriptions than we have um, availability in the course. So, for instance, um, Mr. Lenane, our our business department chair, would tell you that you know we have hundreds of course requests for entrepreneurship and marketing and financial planning. We have one business teacher in the school and unfortunately are not able to meet demand uh, for all of the students who request business courses. Um, because of that, if you're if that's an interest area for your child, you know, I would make sure that they are indicating that that's a high priority elective for them. Um, you know, really make sure they sign up. They can list uh, as their alternates, other business courses. You know, that's just one example. Um, our engineering and tech ed courses also. Um, but uh, it's important that students, as they look through the program of studies, identify not just that one course they most want to get into, but to come up with a list of four, five, six elective options that, you know, if I don't get into my first choice, you know, I've put some good thought into it. This is something else that I'd, I'd be interested in. Um, we can talk to them about, you know, where might they not even recognize that there are course opportunities um, within our program of studies that match some of their interest areas. And again, just coming back to that idea about balance and really um, encouraging and making sure that your students uh, really know, know themselves um, and know uh, really that they're taking on a, a load that is manageable and um, will allow them to have space in their lives for the things that matter most to them. Um, just a, a few additional considerations and, and things that I know are, are often discussed. Um, strength of schedule. So um, I, I mentioned that soapbox before. Um, you know, there are, it's a feather in a student's cap when they're recommended to stretch themselves and they're, um, you know, told that their teacher has the confidence in them, um, that, you know, they are, you know, working at a level where they can manage, you know, the most challenging program that might be available to them. Um, and if you have any older children, um, you may well have sat in an admissions uh, information session at a college and heard someone use the expression, um, you know, a student should take the most rigorous program available. Um, there, there, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, it is actually, for many students, an appropriate challenge. We have students who uh, challenge themselves in, in all sorts of areas and thrive. Um, and uh, just representing the counseling department, I would tell you that um, there are a, a significant number of students who are really, um, one of the phrases that we use sometimes is suffering silently, um, feeling highly anxious, feeling um, overwhelmed uh, because they haven't given themselves permission to not go pedal to the metal in everything that they do all the time. And it's just one area where um, as we think about mental health and as we think about creating a healthy culture, um, I just encourage you to have that conversation with your child if they are a highly ambitious, hard charging student um, to make sure that they know that that's a safe conversation to have if they are feeling overwhelmed. Um, hand in hand with that, encouraging your kids to make sure that they are planning time for joy in their lives, whatever that looks like. If that's, you know, 20 minutes of playing the piano if that's listening to music, if that's, you know, going for a run, if that's playing video games, you know, none of those things are um, 
are, are, are obstacles to your child's success. Um, you know, whatever is going to nurture them, nourish them and bring them joy um, should have a, a place in their day. Um, students might find the need to sort of buck peer pressure. Maybe their whole friend group is taking a certain class. It's not necessarily what they want to do. This is a good opportunity for them to express their, um, you know, their, their individualism um, and potentially also academic peer pressure, um, right? You know, if, if um, I'm just going to name it, um, we will oftentimes in certain peer groups have kids having conversations with one another. How many honors classes are you going to take next year? Oh, you're taking three? I'm taking four. Um, Intentional or not, uh, there are these kinds of competitions that um, can develop amongst uh, friends even, and um, it's not always an unhealthy thing. There's something to be said for healthy competition, um, but there are many instances that we see where it can become unhealthy. Um, so just being aware of that peer pressure and making sure, again, um, that your child feels like they have, um, you know, the, the agency to, to make decisions for their reasons um, and not necessarily because their friend is, is doing a certain thing. Um, some of our courses uh, emphasize depth versus breadth in different ways. Um, what I mean by that is a course that really is emphasizing um, depth um, is not necessarily moving at a very fast pace, but is making um, significant connections to prior knowledge. Um, it, it's, you know, so in, in terms of what is this, how does this play out in um, a program area? So breadth might be, you know, is your child trying lots of different kinds of electives um, versus are they staying in one program area? They found a love for photography and they want to take every photography course that we offer as a school. So not only are depth and breadth sort of uh, attributes of the courses that we're offering, but within different program areas. Um, so it's just something for your child to think about. Do they want a range of experiences or do they want the most um, advanced experience that they can have in one particular area? Um, and lastly, just this idea of focusing on, on the why. Um, if your child is saying to you that there's something that they're interested in and you're a little skeptical, you know, maybe it's that they are trying to load up on too many honors courses and you're not comfortable. Maybe it's that they want to take three art classes and you're sort of saying, well, wait a second, math is important too. Um, you know, asking them the why um, and understanding their thinking, where they're coming from, um, those are some things and certainly conversations that counselors will have with your children too. But uh, just all of those are um, thoughts, ideas, hopefully you find them helpful. Um, you know, take what you do find helpful, leave the rest. Um, but uh, if you have any questions at the end of the day, uh, let your child's counselor know, and we can sort of navigate this process right alongside you and your student. All right. So I'm going to, um, so thank you, Dan. Um, I'm going to spend uh, a couple of minutes talking about the uh, state testing requirement, um, which uh, as ninth graders, uh, you're children will have to st uh, start doing this year and then move into next year with a couple of other requirements. And then after that, I wanna make sure we have time to answer. I know there's two open questions um, right now. And then if there are any other ones that come up about what Dan just spoke about or what I'm about to speak about, definitely ask those questions as well. And so we can answer as many of your questions as we can uh, this evening. So MCAS is the state test for Massachusetts. It stands for Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System, and it is a requirement for any student in a public high school to, um, in a public Massachusetts high school, to pass certain tests to graduate. So those tests are ELA, so English Language Arts, uh, Math, and then Science. So Science comes in a number of different flavors. It could be the Biology or the Physics. There we They used to offer a chemistry test, but this year is the last year they're offering it. So more likely than not, anyone who has a um, child on this call will, would not see the chemistry test and it won't be a thing after this school year. So 
most ninth graders, I believe, are enrolled in physics. So in June of grade nine, um, the science M uh, students take the science MCAS. So every ninth grader will, will take that MCAS exam for the first time. And again, typically it's physics. It might be biology, depending. Um, and that's a computer-based test. In grade 10, there's two uh, tests that students will take. They'll take the English language arts exam in March, and then they'll take the math exam in May. And students have to pass each of these tests to graduate. There are provisions for retests and makeups and so on and so forth if a student happens to be absent or if a student uh, doesn't pass the first time. And then there are also other things that can happen if they meet other score thresholds. But for the sake of simplicity for now, the gist is that the students have to pass each of those tests uh, once to graduate. And on that slide, there are the first times that they will take those tests. So the June science test in, partic in particular is, um, I believe it's the uh, sixth and the seventh. It's like a Tuesday and a Wednesday that, that week. And during the uh, testing, the way that we do it here at Newton South is that students, only students who are testing will be in the building at the beginning of the school day for those dates. So you'll hear from me, um, as you hear from me every week in the weekly updates, um, you'll hear from me, especially for this saying, you know, here's the schedule for this day. The, the uh, test takers will come in first thing in the morning as they always would, but then everyone else comes later in the day. So there's two different sets of buses. So for March and May, when the 10th graders are taking their MCAS exams, your students will actually be home for a bit and then they'll come in later. But then in June, your students will come first and then the rest of the students will come um, later. So once all the students do come to school, we'll have a reduced modified class schedule. Before that, for the first three hours or so of the day, we actually don't have um, any classes at all. It's just, just testing and nothing more. Um, you'll hear more details about these schedules as we get closer to the date, um, once we start to plan those things out. And then it's important to also note that students have to use their school issued Chromebooks to test. So. Um, ideally, every student would have gotten a Chromebook at the beginning of the school year or at some point during the school year if you came in later. Um, and you'll have to bring that, the students will have to bring that Chromebook with them to testing. So one of my major roles here at Newton South and the, well, is, is being the MCAS test coordinator. So whenever it comes to state testing or questions about that, um, definitely reach out to counselors if you have questions about that too. But usually I'm the person who ends up answering, you know, how is this student doing with on track uh, with the track towards graduating in terms of these different things. So I keep track of all that progress there. So it's a big thing. We'll be talking to students about it um, as well, but I just want to put it on your radar that it is something coming up in June for the science. And then it will be coming up next year, two other times. There's no MCAS for 11th or 12th, or 12th grade once you pass the 9th and 10th grade ones. So at this point, it is uh, 7.30. I know that... Um, Dan is working on answering one question that's currently in the Q&A, so want to give it a minute to see if there are any other questions that came up about anything that we talked about uh, before we sign off for the night. So you can give it a, a minute or two and see if any other potential questions came up before we uh, call it an evening. And I will actually say as well, if you don't have any questions and you feel like you're all set, um, we're hoping to get this recording up on the NSHS YouTube channel soon. I'm hoping to also put it in the next weekly update as well. So if you don't have any questions and you are satisfied, I hope you have a good evening and um, we hope to see your students in school tomorrow. But if you do have a question, do um, feel free to get sit tight for just a minute or two. We will um, have to close out pretty soon, but if you have a quick question, we can definitely um, try to answer it pretty quickly in the last minute or two here. I had muted myself uh, again. Um, Jen, you might wanna jump in on this one as well, but I saw one of the questions that came in is, is there a place we can learn more about new media communities? Um, certainly the program of studies is one avenue. Um, your child's teachers may be able to help you. Um, Jen um, is a wealth of information um, as it is uh, within her department. Um, and Jen, I, I, are, is there going to be a wind block uh, for students to learn about the interdisciplinary um, programs? We did that, we did that last year um, and we have a nice graphic on it as well. I guess the person who asked that, do you have a specific 
question about new media that you're wondering? If so, I guess put it in the chat. But um, we will have more information and your child can definitely ask their teacher and we'll have a session for kids to ask more questions. But if you, if you have a question and wanna put it in the chat, maybe I could answer it. I see oh. there's a question here that says, are the small learning communities available for CP courses? Yes. And yes, all, all of our small learning communities are offered at three levels. I will say if a student at the CP level really would struggle working in a class with 24 students where students might be doing different things, that would not be a good fit. So some students at the CP level really benefit from being in a smaller class and getting more targeted help. And then you know, the new media or the Da Vinci or global at the CP level is, is gonna have modified assignments and they'll have you know work targeted at their reading and writing level. However, they're functioning in a large class. So part of the decision for any student is does working in that class with three levels, is that a good fit for them? So that's one thing to consider for students at the college prep level. Mm -hmm. um, I am right. seeing a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Williams, were you going to jump okay. in? I was going to quickly answer the question about, um, I was starting to type it, but I'll actually just say it out loud. So this, um, what happens if students don't pass MCAS? I remember last year I made a Ted Lasso joke and said, believe, but um, and I still feel that way. Like, you know, we our, our strong hope is that, you know, our coursework will adequately prepare, prepare students for that test. And generally speaking, there is not an issue there. But yes, it is, it is very possible that a student will take MCAS the first time and will not pass it the first time. So, you know, what happens, right? So it's, and it's a very good question. Again, my, if you can picture the Ted Lasso picture, believe it's, it's not going to happen. Your student's going to pass the first time. It's going to be great. It's going to be, you know, Every, everything's going to be awesome. But if it doesn't work out, um, there are other opportunities that are set up. So for example, uh, math and English have retests that happen in both November and March. So we register students for that if they've either come to Newton South later, like let's say, for example, a 10th grader is supposed to take ELA in March of their 10th grade, but they don't come until June of their 10th grade or until the 11th grade, we would sign them up for a retest and um, they could do that. Or if a student fails, they can take a retest and then um, work again from there. And, and kind of getting into the uh, prep sessions question, kind of like uh, segueing to that, um, depending on student need, um, I, I've talked to department heads in the past about potentially setting up wind blocks for students if they need assistance um, and need uh, prep blocks for MCAS. Um, there's also some practice tests online um, that students can do. And if you ever have any questions about like seeing those practice tests, you can uh, definitely send me an email. Um, I send the weekly update every week. So you can just reply to one of those. Um, and I can find those practice tests for you that they can take. And um, the other thing I wanted to quickly mention, which is not a direct um, answer to those two questions, but kind of part of an answer to uh, the question about the description of the Da Vinci program is I put a link to this year's program of studies in the chat um, on the school website. So th that's a good place to look for some of the stuff that we've offered this year and our offerings for next year aren't gonna change so drastically that looking at this would be totally um, outdated. So looking at this year's program of studies would actually be a good resource to kind of get a preview of what to expect when we release a new one. Once we release a new one, we'll let everyone know as well. Mm -hmm. And I see one final question, which is a perfect one to end the night with, because it's about uh, celebrating to, to end a successful first year of high school. The question is, um, what, what information do we have about activities like the freshman uh, end of year activity? Um, in this particular question, it asks about the freshman boat cruise, um, which some of you with older children may have been familiar with. Uh, so uh, I'm going to share a, a little bit of information, which is just that I know our ninth grade end of year um, activity is going to be on um, April 29th, I believe is the date. Is that right, uh, Will and Jason? I think that's what we heard from Ms. Strauss. Yep, I think so. April 29th, yep. And um, unfortunately, it will not be a boat cruise this year. Um, my understanding is that after uh, the the 
boat crews had shut down um, during COVID, that the particular vendor that we had used um, is no longer in business and operating. Um, other vendors that they had reached out to were significantly more expensive, like prohibitively expensive for a ninth grade boat cruise. Um, so unfortunately, uh, that tradition um, is not uh, being resurrected, at least not this year. Uh, but uh, my understanding is that the students will be having a dance, a class dance. Is that correct, um, Jason? It's um, so I, I think details are still yet to be determined, but it may be leaning that way. Um, all we know for sure that it definitely is going to be on April 29th, I believe from like seven to 10 or so. And that is on the school's um, calendar as well. So if you check the Newton South website and you look at the calendar um, page, the that event is on the calendar for sure. So definitely save the date for your students to have fun on a Saturday night. Excellent. Safely with us. So. All right. And I believe that, um, you know what, I'm just seeing one more. Nope, that's the same question. And we are going to close that out. Uh, so we really thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, or if you're watching this recorded, uh, for having the patience to uh, to sit through um, what I hopefully you found was an informative uh, discussion. So thank you. Have a good night. And uh, we'll, we'll, we look forward to partnering. Take care. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night, all.